Philippians chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 7. The title of the lesson is Having God's Peace Through Turmoil. Having God's Peace Through Turmoil. In my last Sunday school lesson, we studied verses 5 through 6, or at least the first part of verse 6. We looked at the subject of the imminency of our Lord, that he's always at hand. Whether it refers to him being ever present spiritually with us, or if it refers to that always us always being a moment away from dying and being in his presence. And then we looked at the subject of anxiety, based on the command here for us to not be full of care. And then we looked at one of the vital solutions to which we can prevent anxiety. And to prepare our minds and our hearts to be able to deal with the difficulties of life that we all will face and that we're going to be discussing again in this lesson. And that solution was prayer. And then we looked at the subject of prayer and how prayer should include supplications, which is requesting something of God for God to supply something, which can be broken up into different types, like requesting forgiveness or imprecatory prayer or intercessory prayer. However, we didn't have time in my last lesson to look at another aspect of prayer altogether besides supplications uh, that's also mentioned in verse 6, but that must always accompany supplications, which is thanksgiving. So we're going to be looking today at the subject of thanksgiving and prayer. Uh, we're going to be continuing our study here of the set, seventh section of my outline of the Apostle Paul's epistle to the Philippians in chapter 4, verses 2 through 9. And today we're looking at the subject of contentment and our ability to have contentment. In my last lesson, we saw the need for prayer to help us to have the right mindset in this life and so that we could deal with these difficulties of life. And in today's lesson, we're going to see that Thanksgiving also gives us the means to handle uh, the difficult circumstances of life to most effectively uh, glorify our Lord and to provide us the peace of God in our hearts and minds. A wonderful subject for us to go over, in which we're actually going to have to scan it over this lesson and the next, uh, the subject of the peace of God. And so I have three main points in my lesson today which will be based on the observation that we're going to see here in these two verses. Uh, but let's go ahead and start in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have to spend in your word, to understand it more. And we ask that you will give us your grace to not just understand it, uh, but to apply it to our lives by your grace. And that you will give me clarity of thought and speech as I do so. And all of us are going to take a part to apply it. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And so let's go ahead and read for context, starting in verse 4 of uh, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We're not going to have the time today to look at the second part of that verse, but we will look at the subject of having the peace of God. But first, I want to look at the subject of thanksgiving and prayer. My first point is the inclusion of thanksgiving in all prayer. Verse 6, he says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. I want us to notice here that the Apostle Paul commands us to always include thanksgiving in prayer. Amen. It's not just a good practice. This is a command to always remember to thank the Lord in every matter, in every prayer. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, he says, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. To pray for everything, to rejoice in everything, but also to be thankful in everything we face, every matter of life. Thanksgiving should not just be a part of prayer that occurs at meals, uh, when we're thankful for our food, 
It shouldn't just be in the morning when we're thankful for another day of life. It shouldn't be when we're making long prayers of Thanksgiving during the holiday of Thanksgiving. It's not the only times that we should be thankful. Also related to Thanksgiving is praise and rejoicing. Amen. That they should also be a regular part of our prayer. And I mentioned when we say verse 4 about rejoicing, I mentioned that rejoicing in the Lord includes rejoicing out loud and before others. However, our prayer should also include rejoicing in the Lord. Not only in public prayer, but also in our private prayer. Not just being thankful, but also rejoicing in the Lord. Thanksgiving is a necessary part of every prayer, and yet it's often overlooked. If the Christian even makes time for prayer, are we even making time for prayer, uh, let alone to remember to thank the Lord during what possibly short time of prayer that we have? Praying with thanksgiving has an important benefit. Not just giving praise and glory to the Lord as we're created to do, but thanksgiving is also a mechanism. It's a mechanism through which the Holy Spirit corrects and improves the Christian's mindset regarding life. It can cause the Christian to realize many things. It can cause him to realize that the things that he doesn't have might be things uh, that he shouldn't want in the first place. And he'll realize that when he's thankful for what he has. Or he might realize that he doesn't actually need the things that he's requesting, real thinking that he needs. It's James chapter 4, verse 3, Brother PJ quoted this last week. He says, He asked and received not because he asked amiss that he may consume it upon your lust. Maybe you're realizing that you're not getting what you need or what you want because it's not what you should want or need. Thanksgiving also causes the Christian to realize why his situations aren't going well. Why am I going through turmoil? Why am, I going through, why am I going through difficulties in life? Well, Thanksgiving might cause us to realize why. Maybe instead of asking for God to take away the bad circumstances, that Christian should instead be asking for God to help him to understand the purpose of the circumstances. What is there for me to learn here? What is there for me to do here? Maybe how he should handle it, you should be praying for. Maybe uh, to pray to ask God to help him to glorify the Lord through the circumstance, not to just have him take the circumstance away. Thanksgiving can cause the Christian to reconsider that his heart or his priorities aren't in the right place in the first place because he's being prideful, because he's being covetous, because he's possibly not humbly seeking to glorify the Lord in every matter for which he's praying. <clears throat> and then you got to point out here, I have, you have to notice here that it's hard to thank God when the Christian has pride in his heart, when he has covetousness in his heart, when he has wrong priorities, because it's unnatural to be thankful while at the same time walking in sin and your own pride and covetousness. Thanksgiving also prevents anxiety because it can cause a Christian to realize that there's always a cause for rejoicing, to be thankful, that things are not as bad as they could be, and that God is in control, and that God has the best of interests for that Christian in mind. And he, could, he would realize that if he was forced to thank God for something. <laughs> There's a good chance that he would be realizing that he needs to thank God that his circumstances are worse, and that God is in control, and that God has his best interests in mind. If a Christian's supplicatory prayer, in which he's asking God for things, for knowledge or for solutions to the circumstances, doesn't include thanksgiving, he's doing much worse than just sin by failing to obey this command. If the Christian neglects thanksgiving and the praise of God and rejoicing in the Lord, he's also missing an important aspect of prayer that's designed to help him to cope 
with the difficulties of his life, to prevent him from worrying, from having anxiety, and from failing to know why he's in that bad situation in the first place, or maybe put himself into that bad situation and self-inflicted. And so we should always be rejoicing and offering to God our thanks, without which we will fail to have an effective prayer life, and without which we will fail to, to overcome this, this discouragement or fear or anxiety. We will not be effective in overcoming that without prayer, without thanksgiving. Second point. Let's move on to the peace of God, the subject of the peace of God. A wonderful subject. There is a difference, I want to point out off the bat, there is a difference between a person being given peace with God and a person being given the peace of God. Two very important differences of what peace we're referring to here. A person is given peace with God when he's reconciled with God. He's made at peace with God, uh, which is when, of course, he's born again, when he's saved from his sins. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's an important fact to face when every person is born again that that person, when he was without Christ, realizes that he was a rebellious sinner, that he hated God, and that he was at war with God, and that God's wrath was upon him. He must realize his heart's condition for him to be saved, that he is not at peace with God. However, after salvation, that sinner is graciously made into an obedient saint. It goes from a sinner to a saint. And he should now love God. You should now be at peace with God. And upon him now God bestows truth and mercy and love and kindness. And a person cannot have peace with God, let alone having the peace of God in his life, if he hasn't been reconciled with God, the God of peace, and have him with him and in him. Romans chapter 15, verse 33 now the God of peace be with you all. He is the God of peace. If we want peace, we need God. And so we cannot have peace with God or the peace of God without God's intervention, without God's help. And then once the Christian has been reconciled with God and given that peace, he can begin to have the peace of God provided to him in his life. The peace of God the definition of the peace of God, or at least an explanation of well, some synonyms of the peace of God. The peace of God provides the Christian tranquility, calmness. It provides the Christian comfort, encouragement. It provides the Christian joy. It provides the Christian contentment. And it provides the Christian confidence in his mind and in his heart. That's a good explanation of what it is to have the peace of God in a person's mind and heart. The peace of God in the heart and mind of a Christian is irrespective of that Christian's circumstances. It is not dependent on his circumstances. Uh, and this is the peace that, that hymn that we just sang, a wonderful peace on hymn number 288, nails what this peace is. Uh, I just described. He says in the first verse, Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than, than song. In celestial-like strains it unceasingly falls over my soul like an infinite calm. It's an infinite calm. What a treasure I have in this wonderful peace. We're going to get to that in the next lesson, the treasure that we have in the peace of God. Resting deep in the heart of my soul, it's in the heart. It's based on your heart's condition. So secure that no power can mine it away while the years of eternity roll. I am resting tonight in this wonderful peace, resting sweetly in Jesus' control. For I'm kept from all danger by night and by day, and his glory is flooding my soul. What a great description, again, of the peace of God. 
that the Christian ought to have in his heart and life. As we saw in a recent lesson, like with Job, even when a person is facing the greatest turmoil and suffering in life, he can have confidence that he's right with God. But another observation about Job is that in spite of how spiritually mature Job was, that the word of God states that he was, what Job failed to realize and which robbed him of his inner peace of God was that even when God puts the saint through the worst of trials, God has that saint's best of interest in mind. Job failed to realize that. And Job, I think, had a lack of the peace of God in his heart and life because he failed to realize that concern. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. And so we should have not just confidence that we're in Christ, but we should have the peace of God in our hearts, no matter what is going on in our lives. What a great lesson to learn from Job. So my last point, my third point, is how to have the peace of God. How to have the peace of God. As I mentioned, the peace of God is, is not dependent on circumstances. You need to understand that. Your peace of God, the peace of God in your heart, is not dependent on your circumstances. And so a person doesn't need to have peaceful circumstances to have peace in his heart and mind. And that is a wonderful truth because the circumstances of everyone's life, the circumstances that everyone faces in life are dire. Life circumstances are not easy. It's difficult. Life is not made to be easy. And so those who constantly battle stress and anxiety and fear and depression, they always say that they can't handle their difficult circumstances. I'm going through a difficult circumstance, and I can't handle it. It's too great for me. My circumstances are outside my control, and it's affecting and ruining my heart and my mind. And it's because they're letting their circumstances control the peace of God in their heart and mind. I recently had an acquaintance say that he's facing difficult circumstances. And so you got angry, you got defensive, you got accusatory. And he said himself that he couldn't be re reasonable in our discussion uh, at the time. He admitted that his circumstances were dictating uh, the ability for him to be able to handle the situation. Uh, but this isn't the only time that he's faced difficult circumstances. It's happened often before. Uh, he's always saying that he's having difficult circumstances. And so it almost causes us to think that we have to walk on eggshells, uh, that we have to be careful in how we act around that person uh, because he's always having difficulties in life and taking it out on others. But unfortunately, many times those difficult circumstances are self induced or they could have been avoided. And they many times aren't really as bad as we make them out to be. And so difficult circumstances are a regular part of everyone's life. It's not just him that faces, faces these difficult circumstances. It wasn't just Job. Difficult circumstances are a part of everyone's life, especially those who serve the Lord. They will suffer persecution if they have live a godly life in Christ Jesus. And so we should keep in mind that being reconciled with God and having peace with God does not mean that the Christian is guaranteed peace and tranquility and ease in his circumstances for the rest of his life. It's all going to be a bed of roses because you have faith and, and that you're saved from your sins. That's not the way our life is intended to work. The difficult circumstances, along with a person's discontentment or fear and anxiety, will also never stop. The turmoil in our hearts and minds will never stop unless God intervenes. And so let's look at how we can have the peace of God in our hearts and minds so that God might intervene and give us that peace of God. In verse 7, the Word of God says that the peace of God is only provided to the Christian through Christ. 
through Christ Jesus. He is the source of the peace of God. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He's already overcome all the circumstances that we've been faced. What we need is for him to provide us peace, and it only comes through him. On the other hand, if a person is without Christ, but he has everything that this life and this world could offer him, he will still have discontent. Amen. He'll still have fear. He'll still have insecurity. He'll still have sorrow. He'll still have conflict in his heart and in his mind. Not just because the wrath of God is upon him, but also simply because he doesn't have God with him. We were just talking about this in our family Bible class, about the need uh, that of the trouble that, that King Saul had, that he, was, he felt like his, his throne was always being threatened by David. And we're sure he was like, why doesn't he just give it up? <laughs> just give it up. And I said, well, that also applies to money. That we also, having all the money in the world, then you become defensive of that money. Always need to protect it. Always need to get more. And wherever the case is, you will still be discontent. There will still be fear. There will still be anxiety. If you have everything that this world and this life could offer you. Now I want us to notice here that that peace of God is not an action. The peace of God is not something we do. It's not something we can get in and of ourselves. We can't just make the peace of God happen in our hearts and minds. The peace of God has to be given. It has to be given by God to us. It's only given through the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a result of us meeting certain conditions. If you don't meet these conditions, you won't have the peace of God in your heart and life. And so we uh, are just as dependent upon God to give us the peace of God as we are dependent upon him to give us peace with God. Having the peace of God in one's heart is an emotional condition. It's a condition of the heart as a result of what that Christian is doing and what God is doing in that Christian. And having the peace of God in that Christian's mind is a mindset that God gives to that Christian by his grace. It's a mindset that results from having the knowledge of God, understanding how God works, who God is, God's characteristics, mm -hmm. uh, understanding God's faithfulness and righteousness and truth. Also, it's having the grace of God. It's also being dependent upon God. It's also trusting God. And it's also being obedient to God. That's what results in having the peace of God in our hearts and minds. Isaiah 26, verses 3 through 4, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. It's God that has to keep us in perfect peace. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. There's a condition, though, whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord. For in the Lord God Jehovah is everlasting strength. We can have peace and strength that only God can give us, irrespective of our circumstances, because God is the one who gives it to us. A Christian having the peace of God in his heart occurs when he realizes that all that he has in Christ is worth what he's going to. It's worth it. And when he realizes that, he can have peace. Then when he understands that, he understands what he is in Christ and what he has in Christ, and he's sure that he's right with God, then it causes him to have that joy and peace in his heart and mind. The peace of God is a mindset and an emotional condition that results from being led of the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. The peace of God can only occur when a person has a close relationship with the Lord. Many of us possibly don't have a peace of God, the peace of God in our hearts and lives, because we don't have a close relationship with the Lord. He must also be obedient to the Word of God, and he needs to not be harboring sin in his heart and life. And so in the context here, we also see that the peace of God is also another direct result of prayer, of thanksgiving. 
that should include both supplications and thanksgiving. That results in the peace of God. When we are thankful in prayer, then he says, and the peace of God uh, will, will keep us. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you're called in one body, and be ye thankful. That we're called to do it as a church, to seek to help one another to walk in peace, to have peace rule in our hearts, and to be thankful together as a church. Then verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Another way for us to help one another to have the peace of God in our hearts and minds. Verse 17, and whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Thankfulness, twice you mentioned, being related to the peace of God, having the peace of God in our hearts and minds. And so if a person finds that he's lacking in the peace of God in his heart and mind, the cause is not his circumstances. Even though the Christian's self-induced bad circumstances sometimes could have been avoided and, and could have been handled uh, prayerfully and biblically and wisely, uh, but still, many times, bad circumstances are an indicator that there's a root problem. There's another kind of root problem. And just like having the peace of God in one's heart has a, a greater root problem. If the Christian is lacking of the peace of God in his heart and mind, the root cause is his own heart. It's his own mind. It's his own spiritual condition that is within the Christian. And if he is lacking the peace of God, it's probably because, in one way or another, he's making wrong decisions. He's doing something the wrong way. And so he doesn't have peace about it. Even more simply put, the Christian's lack of the peace of God is most likely due to his failing to seek God in prayer and reading the Bible. And he's failing to trust and to depend upon God. Or is failing to walk in the Spirit, or is failing to serve the Lord as the ought. The key indicators that somebody does not have the peace of God in his heart, and those are probably what he needs to correct to have the peace of God in his heart and mind, in spite of the circumstances. And so, in closing, in this lesson, we see the importance of constant thanksgiving and prayer, and how it can contribute to our having no anxiety and are having instead the peace of God in our hearts and minds. And then we saw what the peace of God is and how we can have the peace of God in our hearts and minds. However, we haven't seen the why. We haven't seen the why yet of why we need the peace of God and why the peace of God is so important to us, which we're going to see in my next lesson when we study the rest of this verse. And we're going to move on also to seeing another important way in which the Christian can have the peace of God by controlling his thoughts. And so that was the lesson today. Any other, any comments or questions, Pastor, anything to add?